Okay, got the recording started. Hopefully this time I can have a recording with sound. Sure, unmutes are correct. Okay, uh, let's begin this meeting. Oscoda Township regular board meeting for April 27th, 2020. Um, go ahead with roll call. Ms. McGuire. Here, and um, Jim Beyer is in the process of logging in. Okay. Mr. Cummings. Here. Mr. Nordine here. Uh, Mr. Palmer. Here. Mr. Gajewski. Here. Mr. Beyer. All right, I'll mark him absent for the time being. Uh, Mr. Weed. Here. All right, for agenda additions, does anybody have anything? Um, I do. I'd like to add the closing of the sweep account. What do you mean by that specifically? Um, I just want to get the board's permission to uh, close the sweep account and put all the money into the che the common checking. What is the sweep account, Jamie? Um, that is money that uh, a long time ago you used to be able to get a target <coughs> balance at a bank, and they would not they would not let you earn any interest on that, and then they would offset all your fees that you paid like per deposit and for your deposit tickets, for your checks, those sorts of things. And then what they would do is they would sweep your money in and out of that account every night. And so the remaining balance that you had in there would earn the interest, but that target balance never did. But um, for the past couple of years, we've been going back and forth with our current local bank and um, we're not getting all the fees waived and those sorts of things so there really is no use for the sweep account any longer so, and it doesn't earn any more interest than the regular common checking so it's just kind of like get it all together to where it belongs that type of thing and then maybe consider an rfp down the road all right okay thank add you. that to other number three I'd like to uh, request adding a public comment period to the beginning of the meeting as we normally do. Hello. 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 I'm here. Hi, Tech Jim is finally here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Jim. On a flip phone. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. For the additional public comment, we'll add it under number, other number four. No, I mean, I mean, I'm proposing adding it immediately following this section. Not to discuss it, but to add a section for public comment at the beginning of the meeting. Why do you feel we need that, John? Um, Let's go ahead and add that to uh, right before the consent agenda to discuss it. Does anybody else have anything else to add? All right, is there a motion to approve the agenda with changes? I'll make a motion that so we approve moved. the agenda. Support. Motion by Ms. McGuire, support by Mr. Palmer. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll discuss the first public comment period. Uh, to answer Mr. Palmer's question just a second ago, um, normally we have two public comment periods. Our board rules policy um, talks about having two public co public comment periods before and after, uh, you know, preceding the meeting and then following the meeting. The um, you know the major majority of the meeting, um, and and during this time, I think uh, you know a chance for the public to comment is 
just as important, if not more important than under normal circumstances for uh, transparency and, and whatnot. Um, I also had a, a resident request or question why there was not one at the beginning of the meeting, which you know raised the question in my mind as well. So, so my thing on this is that um, managing, uh, you know, right now we've got 43 people uh, in here and managing all the people um, in the muting and unmuting and dealing with the public comments and having two public comment periods um, and there's people constantly coming in and out of it, um, like has been in the past meetings. Um, by law, we're required to only have one public comment. Um, and I think under these circumstances, that's, that's what we need. Um, so, uh, I think that when we get back to normal type meetings, then we can go back to two public comments, but under this platform, it is not real conducive for managing numbers of people. And we're not denying any public comments. They still have their public comment time. Yeah. And I understand the, the difficulty of the current situation. Um, and I understand we're, we're still offering the time as required by law, but um, the, the opportunity for the public to comment before the meeting, I think, is valuable because then we hear from the public if there's some input on a specific agenda before we item, before we act on it. And there's all sorts of things that this situation um, makes even more difficult to perform, but we still have a job to do. And, and I think this is part of that. I know it's, I know it's harder, but it's something we, I think, owe the public. John, are you proposing we just switch the public comment from end to beginning? No, I think I'm proposing add, so we have two as normal. Uh, well, I, I think our situation is anything but normal, and um, it just seems to me that the previous meetings we've had where we've had one public comment period, um, everyone has been able to have, you know, pose their comments as they saw fit. Uh, I think given the situation we're in, uh, one public comment uh, time is enough. I can't remember uh, when we've been in normal times where anybody's had a public comment that has affected anything that we've, we've business we've transpired on the agenda. So, I think uh, um, if we have a public comment at the end, we're, and we'll stay on as long as we need to to uh, let everybody say what they need to say, I, I don't see where there's a problem with that. Uh, Jim here, did, did I hear, Aaron, that the, you have 41 people? That 43. Are waiting to, 43, wow. That's a lot. <laughs> Decide whatever you want. Not all for I'm, I'm sorry, not to interrupt, but not all for public comment. Forty-three people participating and viewing the meeting. Not necessarily all of them would. Okay, um, I see. We don't we don't know how many people want to jump in with a verbal participation. Is that what you're saying, John? Correct. Okay. And and I would disagree with Mr. Palmer. I think that. Um, comments made by the public in the past do have an impact on the things, um, on the topics that we consider, especially if you're going in with an open mind, listening to the public uh, on each topic. I think there's valuable input there. And even if there hadn't been in the past, I certainly think there's room for, we don't know what anybody might uh, say in the future. I, and I think it's valuable to allow the public to make comment. I think the public also should have a chance ahead of time if there's a topic that's on the agenda that they want to share their information with. Yeah, could you, as a compromise, could you say if you have something that applies to the agenda and will allow up to 10 people or up to seven or something like that, and no. as long as you want to talk about something, we're going to. Or is that too hard to manage? I don't know. We're not allowed to limit the numbers of people. Okay. Okay. I make a motion to hold a public comment period preceding and following the meeting. 
support. Motion by Mr. Nordine, support by Ms. McGuire. Roll call. Mr. Gajewski. No. Mr. Palmer. No. Mr. Nordine, yes. Mr. Byer. Yes. Mr. Cummings. No. Ms. McGuire. Yes. Mr. Weed. No. Motions failed. Any other comments? I'm sorry to see that, but no, I have no other comments. Okay, the consent agenda, regular meeting minutes of April 13th. Are there any comments? Any comments regarding payment of bills for $211,639.85? Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Actually, um, we... actually I, I wanted to go over, or are we gonna do that after? Um, I had a spot on there for the investment report I wanted to go over with everybody to give them a little bit more information. Okay, yes. Okay, um, I hope everybody got the new one that I sent out the other day when I was preparing for the meeting. I noticed that I had not updated the Michigan class, so I just wanna make sure that you got the correct totals for that. Um, this is for the first quarter for 2020, and there has been a couple different changes to that. I just wanted to let the board know, you might've noticed that the totals decreased a little bit. I cashed in two of the chemical bank CDs for the upcoming water and sewer projects. And um, once the shutdown's over, Michigan class is up and running, I'm going to be transferring that money from our common checking account into Michigan class to earn a little bit higher interest until that money's needed for those projects. Uh, on the last page, or on the second page, you can see that the chart title, it kind of gives you a breakdown where we are taught that it's supposed to be safety, liquidity, and then yield. Um, it, it's kind of pounded into your head actually at every class that you take for investments. So this chart kind of shows the diversity and it does show that our Michigan class has a little bit higher um, holdings than the rest of them but that's okay because you, you can have a little bit higher, but you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket kind of thing. Um, I did check our treasury uh, note, which is what we use as a benchmark for uh, kind of seeing if you're getting a good deal on the interest rates. Uh, and what that is treasury, it's like full faith, no risk type of investments. And we use the three month mark and that's at 0.12 given the, you know, latest with the coronavirus and so things, you know, the Dow's dropped and that kind of thing. Uh, the 0.12 is very low, but if you look at our portfolio, you can still see some of the numbers are still a 2.3, 2.5, 1.45, that type of thing. But unfortunately, those will be dropping. I wanted to give you just a heads up. As a matter of fact, I just renewed Huntington CD today for three months. And um, it's a little less than our benchmark, but with our higher interest rates and all the other ones, um, I didn't want to go out. You can't really go out any further because they actually get worse. But the interest rate I was able to hear was just a 0 0.10, which is really disappointing, but hopefully things turn around. So, and then on the very last page, it talks about the safety of all the banks that we use for the investments. The only change that we have, which is a good change, is here on Community Bank went from a four rating to a five credit score rating. So that's really good. You want all the fours and fives and that's right where we're at. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. I have a question. Thanks, Jamie. I wanted to know if the um, if, if going into a CD, it looked like you're, you're talking about going in for three months. Mm -hmm. is, um, is three months going to present any difficulties? And you know, just to, because it's a time frame, and obviously to to get out of a CD, there's always that early penalty. So uh, is three is three months the the time frame we think is is best? 
If you look at the portfolio there, Tim, you can mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. um, I have a laddered approach, which is what they recommend uh, to have, where you have short term and long term. And actually, 21% of our, actually, it's more than that, 21% of our investments are actually uh, liquids. You can call me, I could call Michigan class tomorrow and move that money out if we needed it in an emergency. I see. That was what I was looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other comments regarding the consent agenda? Is there a motion? Yeah, I'll move that we accept the consent agenda. Support. Motion by Mr. Byer, support by Mr. Cummings. Roll call. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Mr. Nordeen, yes. Mr. Byer. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Gajewski. Yes. Ms. McGuire. Yes. Mr. Weed. Yes. Motions passed. Subcommittee reports, project updates, recap of the rescheduled RAB meeting. All right. So um, as an informational item in there, you have a uh, an article from the Osco to Press uh, giving you an overview of the restoration advisory board um, meeting from 415 and um, basically one of the main questions um, going into that is what is going to happen to the 13 and a half million dollars that uh, was appropriated for wurtsmith as far as uh, remediation and um, unfortunately we pretty much got the answer that it's going to go into the investigation of uh um the the contamination and uh more data associated with wordsmith so um i know a lot of the board members attended that and um i know uh we had uh quite a good uh attendance it was a virtual meeting it was the first virtual rab meeting and therefore we had uh quite a bit of representation from uh state reps and and senators and uh their respective offices and um they um they got to hear the same thing we hear from the air force on a uh on a repeated basis so um we uh we actually had dan Kildy um attend virtually and um he commented on um you know what um, what he understands is, as frustrations from the uh, uh, from the public and um, associated with the Air Force's actions. So um, overall, uh, we did not get the answer we wanted as far as the thirteen and a half million dollars, but uh, it was it was a it was a well attended um, virtual RAB meeting. And so whenever we have a new date for the next one, we'll, be, we'll make sure to get that out to the board and and the public. Well, uh, what answer did did you get again? I mean, it wasn't the answer you wanted. Did you get any answer or what? Yeah, they said they were going to use that money for further research um, and investigation, possibly interim actions. Um, and Dan Kildy, um, at the end of the public comment period, said that uh, he knows what the intent of that money was, and it was more for remediation than it just continuing investigations. Wow. So he was pretty upset. Thanks. All right, update on the Township Hall phone system. Yeah, so the, the Township Hall phone system is up and running. The uh, automated attendant that one will now uh, encounter when they when they dial the main township number uh, is just basically announcing that township hall is closed and it doesn't let you access the extensions. Um, the the purpose at this point is that because the the phones were installed while uh, the majority of the township hall folks have been on you know working from home, not able to be in the office. Uh, they haven't been able to set up their phones yet, so we don't have a completely set up, you know, like voicemails and things like that. So 
when we actually have our first day back, there will be instructions as to how to set up the voicemail, record your name. Um, there's a couple of different types of voicemails you can record, and I'll provide some uh, guidance as to you know what what the script should be so that there's consistency from an external viewpoint of how the how the voicemails sound and how it uh, how it's perceived from a from a public view. The um, so the the phone system right now is working. Uh, you can make calls out from from internal uh, to the to the offices, and um, and then the other part is that uh, because we are speaking specifically about the the town hall, the police department phones are not currently active. Their their phone ports uh, will occur uh, at some point. We haven't had heard from Charter. We're get, we're waiting for a date. And, uh, but we expect it to be within the next week or so. So we're just kind of crossing our fingers and just trying to, I would like to get that completed as soon as possible. Uh, but otherwise the phones are already on their desks and we're just waiting for Charter to release those, those uh, police department phone numbers. And then um, ATI will, will activate the phones remotely so they won't require another on-site. I won't have to be on site. It'll all be very uh, just sort of remote and uh, and simple. So all the big work was completed uh, last Tuesday, and and it's uh, and it's done. And I have to say that the the call quality is really good, and uh, the phones are quite nice. Um, I have a couple questions. Sure. I didn't get an email back from you, Tim, so I wasn't sure, but sure. you have to yeah. dial a 1989 to dial out. It's not letting me just dial a phone number. And I don't know how to transfer a call to Melinda because we are working right. in the office. Like I explained in my email that yeah. um, the treasurer's yeah. office is in there at least a couple of times a week. And so I don't know how to transfer the calls and or to send them to their email. Or like if I wanted to, to just call email. her, um, like say, hey, Melinda, you know, I got this bill, whatever that type of thing, instead of, you know, walking over to see her because we're supposed to be social distancing, I'd, I'd ask for <laughs> right. instructions on how to do those things. Honestly, Jamie, I didn't see your email. I have been oh, having really? difficulty oh. with email lately, and it's, I'm sure not you. Uh, there's a number of emails that people have said they've sent. And I haven't gotten them, and I keep thinking that the problem is something with the IT Right Barracuda spam filter. Okay. So I have a, I have to get a call over to them and find out what it is. Normally, I get an email saying something's pending, but mm -hmm. recently I've had no email at all saying that anything needs to be released or or reviewed or anything. So, so I feel something's not right on the okay. email account. So I apologize. I I didn't do that intentionally. No, um, I know. The answer. Oh, it's fair enough. Yeah, but just saying. Uh, so the, so the, um, so in the, so in the bigger picture here, because you're you touched on a few points which are good details. That the, there is a little kind of a user manual. It's a one pager, that talks about like how to do some of the things you were talking about, and so I have that from ATI now. Uh, I didn't have it the day of the uh, of the installation. It took them a while to get it to me. I don't know why, but I suspect. They were trying to get is, their hands on it from home. Right. Is mm -hmm. that the one Melinda has? Yeah, it, because she gave it to me and it what, doesn't address I don't know thing. what she has. Okay. okay. I don't know what Melinda has, to be honest with you. Yeah, I didn't work with Melinda when she was there. I know she was there. And I know that at one point, the, I think she somehow had a voicemail that had come in while they were setting up the phones. And ATI worked with her directly. So mm -hmm. I don't know what they did to set her up or what, what occurred. So anyway, so I'll send you, I'll send you a copy. In fact, I'll, I'll send it to Tammy because it can, it can go out to everybody now. Uh, that's this little user guide. Great. Um, there's also a number you can call if there's questions. I sure. still have a couple questions of my own. I went mm -hmm. in and tried to set up a voicemail just to see how it worked. Um, and to, so I could give some, uh, you know, good instructions to help people understand what, uh, you know, what to expect when you start pushing the buttons and logging in. Yeah. And um, and so I have that clarity, and uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I, I, so I I can provide that information now that I have it myself. 
Thank you. But I think there there may be another question you don't you didn't didn't get answered here, and that is um, <clears throat> you're talking about sending sending a, a voice a phone to, excuse me a, a person to a, like an email, the email thing. Um, so the, let me just explain that for a bit. So when this whole phone service was in, uh, envisioned, we weren't thinking about uh, voicemails appearing as emails. Um, we knew it was a feature, but we didn't think of it as being anything important in, in our usual normal lives, let's say a month prior to a month ago. Um, in fact, we thought it might be annoying for people to get both a voicemail and an email. But right. since the virus kicked in, I was happy that we were able to do it because I had the emails all you know, uh, listed out for ATI, and so they were able to activate that, and it made the ability to work from home uh, that much easier. So, so as far as making that happen, um, there's nothing special you have to do. The person just has to leave a voicemail, and that gets generated in the background. And then as long as a person has uh, remote access to their email, they're good to go. Awesome. And then for di dialing out without a prefix? Yeah, there is no prefix. I mean, I, I understand your question, but I don't know that, that answer, Jamie, because normally, like in some companies, they'll have like a dial nine first or dial eight or something like that. You know, one of those prefix digits that gets you outside. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't have anything like that set up. So if you're trying to call like what, maybe like Tawas or something, I, I think Tawas might require like a 1989 whatever, but I, I don't know. I haven't tried to dial it from the, from the township to know what, how it's behaving. So I don't have experience to, to give you. Okay. On, well, I called the hospital to number. I mean, to, if oh. you actually, if I was <laughs> trying local. to call because um, I was trying to call Melinda actually, because, and I couldn't uh -huh. figure out how to contact her in house. And um, oh, right, when I right, would right. just dial the seven three nine seven five three two, it would dial it, yep. and then it would just hang it up. So then we call the one nine eight nine seven three nine seven five three two, and then it would dial it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so the other the other thing I would I was going to say that is that the um, yeah, like your individual phone numbers that you've had f since time immemorial at the township hall, that go straight to water department or to clerk or to treasurer, those, those are supposed to work. So if, if for example, hers isn't working, um, that's something, you know, let me know and I can get that hooked up right so that they will ring directly in. They're not intended to be in, like, a, like a way to get around the automated attendant. They're just intended to be there for kind of backwards compatibility. We had the numbers before, people are probably used to those numbers. But at some point in the future, they're gonna go away after we have the, we're back in the township, we're stabilized, we're back to a, some new sense of normality. And then we can start to put out a kind of a campaign to, to retire some of those numbers so that we can recoup the cost that we are otherwise paying to. Uh, we were paying to charter and we're, we're now char uh, paying a, a little less, but we're paying still again to ATI. So this is where the cost savings for the system uh, was, was, was based on. So, so then in the future, we would be using the main number and the automated attendant and calls would come in that way. And it's very easy to get to each of the offices, the automated attendant, which incidentally is already recorded, already in place. It just needs to be switched back over to that. It was actually active for the first day, uh, less than 24 hours. And, uh, and we kind of proved it out and then we, we're able to uh, essentially turn it off with the with the auto automated uh, message that says that the virus is shut down uh, you know, Township Hall. So that's what I have to say on that. Are there I any other have, questions? Yeah, I have one question. Sure. So, is the is the police department have functioning telephones right now? Just the old the old ones? Oh, the old ones. Oh, the old the old ones are no longer functioning. In fact, uh, that's also a great little <laughs> cleanup question. When we were going around trying to pick up the old phones, I didn't. Uh, you were already gone, Jamie, so it was late. And so, if you don't mind, just save them. I've got a place. I'm going to put them in the attic. We're going to see if we can try to resell uh, for for kind of like a. Um, there may be people who want to buy them. Okay. Yeah. So the police department doesn't have phones right now. <laughs> 
they do have phones. I mentioned earlier that they don't have the phone service through the system. They're still using the old system, but they have the new phones and they're placed on their desks. The extensions okay. are showing. They can make a call out on the, the, the new system, but they can't make the call in because the phone numbers have not been ported yet. So phone company is still directing calls to the old system. Okay, so can the police department receive a phone call currently? Of course, that's what I just said. Okay, I'm having trouble understanding. I think, I, I think I'm clear now. The, the outgoing calls can be made from old or new system, but to get an incoming call will come through the old system because the phone numbers have not been ported yet. Very good. When they're ported, then they will go to the new system. As long as the police have the ability to make and receive phone calls, I'm, I'm satisfied. We would have heard about it in the last week if they hadn't. <laughs> Tim, I can feel your frustration because Tammy asked me to call the other day in regard to oh. the phone numbers. And I was back and they were shoving me from phone line to phone line to different people for 45 minutes and still didn't help. So. <laughs> Charter has been completely uncooperative. I'm Very just uncooperative. completely uncooperative. I, I cannot begin to tell you how frustrating Charter has been on this. And, and, and it, there's a point I'm going to make just for public comment on this topic since we're on it, is that uh, they even wanted to charge us to, to port each phone number. Okay. And and I, I, I'm shocked that they want to charge us to shut down an account. It's like, really? So I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's worth a conversation to see whether or not we want to give them a call and negotiate on that point. So there you have that. I'm done. All right, Old Orchard Wi-Fi. Oh, fortunately for everybody, this is a much shorter update. So um, essentially, uh, all we are doing right now is preparing for uh, uh, ATI to come out and connect up the electrical. Uh, once the electrical is uh, basically set up, you know, they're going to install a box, uh, kind of a box on a, on a, flat, on a back plane. And um, once that electrical is in place, then they will have what they need to then splice the fiber and trench fiber to that location where the electrical is. And that's, that's necessary for us to activate that fiber down at Old Orchard in order to bring it in. And so um, that's, that's a major point, but certainly it isn't the whole project, but that's the first step. And then we're gonna bring the fiber into, um, uh, into the, the office and the store and the uh, maintenance building and uh, the guard shack for different places. So first step is going and it's going well and you know, we're just kind of in motion on it. They're going to co uh, coordinate all that uh, access to the property with uh, LFCDIS. So everybody's involved who needs to be. Okay, update on the Township Water Asset Management Plan. All right, so um, I've been coordinating with uh, Doug Stevens. I believe he's on the call this evening. And uh, we have been going through the water asset management plan. Um, this is a very similar exercise to the saw grant, um, only instead of the sanitary sewer system and inventorying the infrastructure and um, quantifying the amount of improvements that need to get made, uh, this is all on the water side. What this does is this culminates um, into an actionable plan, as well as a, um, a proof of rates where uh, we as the township need to understand if our rates are going to be able to support the amount of upgrades or uh, repair and maintenance that's going to be needed to the water infrastructure. And so um, at the last meeting, the um, township board moved forward with a rate study uh, with Baker Tilly, Mr. Tom Tracyak, who is the uh, financial advisor. And uh, we have uh, provided all of the information to Baker Tilly associated with the water rate study. 
all of that information provided for the water rate study um, basically culminated from the water asset management plan. I included uh, some of the information through um, F and V and Mr. Doug Stevens associated with the, the with the water asset management plan. Um, I have also emailed a draft out to the board um, for review. And so, what you need to understand is is just like we had with the saw grant. Um, there were work sessions involved. Um, there were discussions about the prioritization of the infrastructure improvements that are needed. And uh, we hope to be able to get a, um, a draft of the water rate study from uh, Tom Tracyak back at the end of May. Um, and, and we will be using that to uh, to schedule some work sessions with the board to discuss very similar to the sanitary sewer system this will concentrate on the water infrastructure and so um what i included in the informational so it was very impressive uh the um the water system map is on page 87 of your board packet and it's very difficult to see um, because you really have to zoom in, but that that shows the survey crews and everything that was um, completed and marked um, as far as the water services and the fixtures associated with the infrastructure from um, all the way uh, from Division Street South all the way up on either side of Cedar Lake. And so um, all of that information just like the sanitary sewer um, will be transferred onto GIS. And so future improvements made to the water infrastructure can be tracked using GIS technology. And so that is the, uh, that is the initiative moving forward is to be able to map and track all of the infrastructure improvements on both the sanitary and the water side. So that's what I have for that update. Much more information to come as we get the as we get the rate study. Did anybody have uh, questions about where we are at while we have Mr. Doug Stevens on the phone this evening? All right. All right, does anybody have anything else for uh, reports and project updates? Okay, then on to, to discuss the township's virus precaution shutdown. So if anybody has anything related to our procedures during the shutdown, uh, any modifications, um, ideas of how to handle some things, um, we can discuss that. One thing I wanted to bring up is regarding um, the parks and the other one regarding um, a, a phased in opening up approach. So All right. with, go ahead. Well, what I was gonna say is basically, unfortunately the, the board packet was, was put out Thursday, the 23rd, and then um, the governor issued executive order 2020-59 on Friday, April 24th. So that's why, this was a placeholder item. I wasn't 100% confident we were going to get guidance um, between now, or I'm sorry, last Thursday and, um, and, and this evening. And so that's, that's why you see that second placeholder item on the agenda as well. But um, to, to build on what Aaron um, was talking about is we have a couple things that have changed from the last time we met. Um, I, on Friday, I emailed out to the board, Executive Order 2020-59, if you reference Section 6, and the, the Executive Order is a 14-page document, Section 6 starts at the bottom of page 5, and it makes it very clear that all in-person government activities are suspended unless it is to sustain or protect life 
And so that kind of makes it very clear that the Township Hall um, will need to stay closed to the public through May 15th at this point. Um, I, I think that directly relates to the same situation with the Robert J. Parks Library being closed through May 15th as well. So um, what Aaron was talking about as far as the parks, the board members, you'll note section 6B, again at the bottom of page five of that executive order, contains language and it, it's stating trash disposal, including composting. The township has not operated the leaf and, and brush drop off um, because the, the township's chosen to, to not expose the employees uh, to provide this service due to the social distancing requirements and, and the number of people this service has, has historically attracted. So uh, unless I hear differently from the board, the, the plan would to be to continue to postpone the leaf and brush drop-off services until after May 15th. And so um, typically we do Saturdays from, from April until uh, the end of May. And then it's one Saturday per month in June, July, August, September. Um, and then in, in mid-October uh, through the weekend after Thanksgiving is typically when we, when we bring that back to weekly service. Um, so in, in that same section for section 6B, it also contains language stating um, that the maintenance of safe and sanitary public parks so as to allow for outdoor activity permitted under this order. So section 6C continues on. It says, for the purposes of this order, necessary government activities include minimum basic operations. And so therefore the, the DPW, so the Township DPW and the Parks and Rec staff is currently working to ensure that the Township's parks are open as normally scheduled. Um, historically, we have opened up the parks on May 1st and, and that would be this Friday. Um, it, it should be stressed that the, the, the public um, will be required to practice social distancing guidelines to mitigate the, the spread of the virus. And it should also be stressed that that includes children using play equipment and, and picnickers in the, in the park pavilions. Everybody is still to practice the, the social distancing guidelines set forth by previous executive orders. And, and so DPW right now, um, Bill Roy, um, started back with DPW today. The plan would be to bring back Alan Campbell and Brandon Wheaton starting next Monday the 4th um, to continue help with the park maintenance, um, basically cleaning the bathhouses, cleaning the, um, making sure the trash is picked up, helping with the mowing um, and maintenance of the parks. And so additional part-time staffing needs after um, will we'll continue to be evaluated by, by the DPW. Um, one of the other things that should be brought to the board's attention, um, if, if you haven't realized, basically um, both the uh, Little League and the, uh, and the Soccer League for the sports complex, both of those have been canceled for the season. And so the DPW is going to be mowing the sports complex, but obviously not having to um, do it to the detail that would, would normally be required for Little League and soccer. Um, Old Orchard Park, the, that crew will ensure that Foot Site Park is mowed and maintained, uh, obviously ready to be open for, for May 1st. And the plan would uh, would also be to continue to uh, keep Old Orchard Park Campground closed through May 15th. The Michigan DNR has kept all camping, lodging, and shelters closed through May 15th as well. And um, so that that's in line with the um, with the state. And obviously, with these virus precautions, we uh, we have been taking guidance from the state as far as the, the phased in approach 
to be able to um, open back up and, and get to back to some sort of uh, semblancy of, of, of normalcy. So um, does the board have, have any questions about that or discussion items, you know, for, for those specific items that I've, that I've gone through? A uh, quick question, Dave, uh, Jim. Uh, Consumers owns the property for Old Orchard. Have they had any input at all, or are they been are they silent? So we we have also confirmed all campgrounds in the state of Michigan owned by consumers are also closed. And um, at this point, uh, we have not had any indication that anybody has deviated or any any consumers um, campground has deviated from the um from the governor's executive orders basically um that they would not open up prior to may 15th okay uh aaron can you unmute al for me he, he's about halfway down i just want to make sure um he's able to chime in there al did you have anything that um i am i am missing as i'm going through here Good evening. Uh, well, some of the things about opening uh, the parks are a great idea and stay in accordance with uh, some of the guidelines set forth by the state of Michigan and the DNR. Uh, they are keeping the restrooms and um, pit toilets closed. Um, I don't know if we should do that. If we shouldn't do that, I know that we are having a hard time getting supplies. Um, Disinfectants, toilet papers, uh, hand hand wipes. Um, that we can't get masks, we can't get gloves, uh, and we have to clean the bathrooms after use. So, um, if we're going to kind of stay with the the state of Michigan uh, guidelines, I think maybe we should we should stay with that too. Uh, I have a question. Yes, Jamie. Um. Couple of them actually. So, for the is it just the DPW workers that are coming back, or is some of the staff from Old Orchard coming back to like get the like clean up and those type of things happening? They are, and um, so Old Orchard is in the process of um, getting back staff, and obviously there's there's going to be social distancing associated, but you can blow leaves six six feet away from other people and um, and and perform the the maintenance duties to to get the park ready for campers when, when we are able to open. And okay, and the other, the other question with that, and I, I get that, especially with the cutting the grass and leaves at the cemetery and that type of thing, but what about the protocol or the safety measures back, like at the DPW barn or at Old Orchard Park when they're, you know, when they're getting to work or when they're leaving or encountering the public? Do, are, are we going to have some type of guidelines for them to follow or have the equipment, you know, like masks or those type of things or anything that's going to help them to, you know, social distance while they're there? I got um, 300 uh, surgical masks that were delivered today. Um, and then I have another 1,200 coming in next week. So we are, um, you know, in the process of uh, being able to get what we can uh the ppe is obviously a little bit more difficult well a lot more difficult to get than normal um we um we did get the 300 uh, disposable surgical masks today so that was delivered today got another quadruple order of that coming next week and they're taking precautions for not sharing vehicles and equipment and such like that and so then the, all the employees that are coming back will be briefed by the supervisors? Yes. Okay. I've got a couple questions as well. Um, so for DPW, are the, the permanent full-time workers, are they working like at maximum capacity right now? So they're, uh, they're coming back, obviously. Um, they're getting everything ready uh, for the mowing season um all of, all of the equipment getting that up and running as well as uh concentrating unfortunately you know they're, they're concentrating efforts right now um at the cemetery 
and then uh, transitioning over to the parks later this week to have them open by uh, Friday, May 1st. Okay, so the, the permanent full-time employees are working their full hours, their 40 hours a week right now? Yeah, Bill is, uh, I know Bill's not on right now, but basically he's been in communication with them, um, being able to assign as far as uh, the tasks that need to get done, as well as um, I, I know basically they're, they're planning to be able to stagger to come into the DPW at different times to get, say, a truck and a trailer and a mower and go somewhere and then the next person comes in and then the next person get, comes in to be able to get that lined up. Okay, so I'm, what I'm asking is, is the reason I'm asking is, so if we're bringing back the seasonal employees, that's on top of the permanent full-time employees working their, Mac, their normal hours? Yeah, so Bill Roy is back. Bill Roy came back today and then Alan and Brandon would be coming back next Monday. Once the parks are open, then they would obviously be doing the the maintenance and picking up the trash and 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 cleaning the the bathrooms and and picking up whatever whatever needs to get picked up around the park. And those individuals are working on top of the normal permanent DPW workers working their normal forty hours. Correct. And then the leaf and brush drop off. I had a resident uh, ask me if like a self drop off program could be. Uh, you you know put put forth or utilize. I've never participated in the drop-off program. I don't know many of the details, so it's just something I thought I'd pass along. See if anybody had any thoughts on that. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we'll look into that. Um, but I can see where there'd be issues with people dropping off things that they shouldn't be. Sure, and I, and I can too. I don't know if there's if DPW has any thoughts on ways to still yeah. monitor the process and the program but try to accommodate the, the citizens. Anything else regarding DPW in the parks? All right, I wanna talk about a phased opening plan. And so let's say that the governor's orders do not uh, extend beyond May 15th. Um, um, or even if they do extend, but um, to do a plan that, uh, as far as opening the township hall to the public, so in the case of the 15th, everybody would return to work on the 18th, uh, but have the township hall remain closed to the public um, for either three to five business days after that, um, so that everybody can get their areas clean, get caught up on work, um, and then we can open up to the public. You have thoughts on that? Sounds with the open, me. with the open to the public, Aaron, uh, just be the same open as in prior to virus, as in however many people come in off. It's not going to be a limited uh, or controlled uh, public exposure. Right. So if the if the governor's orders are completely lifted, then yes. Of course, if the governor puts in some restrictions in there, then we would have to consider that. Fair enough. Okay. Got that. Thank you. Yeah, then it does make sense. I like the phased approach. That was all right to me. Okay, any thoughts regarding three or five business days? Hmm. Not to jump out of me, I could, I mean, I have to consider a little bit, but. Okay, let me know what you think. I think it, the five, are you talking about the week of May 18th being close to the public? Yeah. I think it should be the whole week. That way it could give each um, department a chance to evaluate their area to try to maybe put some markings on the floors for the six feet or to establish signs and those type of things in the, each area to help the people when they come into the hall. Okay. Plus get caught up on their stuff. We're talking. We're obviously talking hypothetical, idealistic dates here. But the um, the 18th, five days after that, would put open to the public on the 25th, which is actually Memorial Day. So just thought, dates to keep in mind. Okay. Good point. All right. Does anybody have any other thoughts?
Okay, then on to the uh, well, the only yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say the only thought I had is if the uh, uh, everyone uh, person in the town hall would be available for people to call in, but that would be you know that's going to be a big improvement over uh, we now or people can't even call um, people in the in the. Right, so you kind of, um, your signal went out a few times there. Um, were you saying about that the, the employees would be available to the public by a phone, but just not in person? Is, did I get that yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think that'll be helpful to the residents to be, at least be able to call into the township. Yeah. Okay, so... Now that we already know the governor's orders have been uh, extended to May 15th, um, do we feel a need to schedule a special meeting on April 30th, which was prior to us knowing uh, there was going to be an extension? Um, do Not we... on the 30th, no. Yeah. I don't see the... I don't see the need to have a, a, another meeting in three days. <laughs> I guess it was, just, you know, it was a placeholder in case we were we didn't get any guidance, and that uh, in case you know we were gonna kind of be be left to the last minute to try to to try to figure this out. But I was I was happy to at least we got the executive order twenty twenty fifty nine that we could kind of come up with something over the weekend for for the meeting tonight orders her state of emergency um authorities end april 30th though correct so and i don't know if they plan on going back into session to do anything about that or if that's anything's going to happen in that meantime but we could always call us we could always call a special meeting um, after the 30th. Actually, I have a conflict because I have, um, I'm going to be on the Cedar Lake Improvement special, their meeting at noon. Yeah, we can always call one if something comes up. Yeah. All right. So does anybody have anything regarding item B for establishing a special meeting? I Has do there know. been any thought on when Old Orchard Park should regain operations? Um, what do you, with the governor's um, extension, what is your your plan regarding that? Because you you had they to have, change out your bidding dates and all that, right? Well, correct. Um, she is is offering that. Um, state parks may be open uh, on the 15th, which I would probably recommend the same. We would probably open on the 15th um, unless we hear anything different. Um, I'd just like to get something to the campers to let them know that uh, we are considering opening on the 15th unless we hear the governor say no. Um, however, you open the state parks, consider that the state parks don't have uh, as many seasonals or seasonal spots to begin with. So there's a um, something to consider. Yeah, um, I mean, not knowing what's going to happen with this, it's kind of playing a little touch and go here <clears throat> with how to plan these out. So there's going to be a lot of last minute things here, uh, especially in dealing with your opening. So Al, I know that May 1st is technically their move-in date. Um, have you uh, given any thought to, I'm sure people, you know, won't be happy because they're paying, um, they're paying for their whole season. Are they going to get a refund or how is that, how is that going to affect their seasonal time? Well, I believe in, in order to be fair for this, um, it would probably be, we would offer them one of two options would be to offer them an extension beyond the last date they're supposed to be out. Uh, 
or credit towards next year's seasonal sites. Have you gotten any feedback from people by, about that? Have you been able to share it with anybody? Uh, I have a few. Um, they seem fine with it, yes. They seem fine with either option. Yeah, I wanted to offer both of them in case you couldn't stay because of family commitments beyond that time. So that way you at least have another option to um, apply a credit towards your seasonal site for the next season. So we, we have a scheduled meeting on May 11th. Uh, if, if, Al, if you're planning to open on the 15th, uh, if we find out by the 11th uh, at our meeting that, that that wouldn't be, would that be enough time to make a change or would you need something before that? It's gonna have to be, um, but I think everybody's kind of playing it by ear right now. Uh, all, a lot of the other campgrounds are doing the same thing. They're kind of given this date as an if, and if we hear something different, we'll let you know. If not, this is how it's going to be. So I, I think okay. it'll be fine as long as we make sure we keep in contact with our with our campers. I guess I I just like to interject in there that we keep saying May fifteenth. Uh, that's a Friday, and the order extends through May fifteenth. So the the soonest it could be open would be the sixteenth, which is a Saturday. Correct, Al? You're correct. Okay. Okay, any other comments? All right, then to the utilities department, work truck conversion. Right. So your packet contains a quote for the utility department truck conversion of $2,581. Half of it will be paid to the sewer fund 590-000-974.000 and half to the water fund 591-000-974.000. And this is for the recently received 2020 Ford F-250. Their request is to streamline the use of the new truck for the purposes of the water and sewer operators. Board members will note that this is a reduced price from the previously provided truck topper option of $4,234, which is a cost savings of $1,653. This is still well under the $15,000 purchasing limit, but I'm bringing it to the township's board. Comments? <clears throat> well, not directly related to this, but I voiced my opinion before that vehicles slash trucks that we share with F and V and DPW and whoever else, we had some damage to one truck to a, and nobody knows who did that or who's responsible. Whoever backed up wrong and tore up this cover thing uh, is a ghost. I really think any vehicles that are traded uh, back and forth shared there should be a clipboard with a sheet indicating who is using it with the name of the operator and who they work for uh i think we got burned pretty bad before and that's going to continue nobody knows who's using it you know there's no record so just a thought is it isn't this vehicle only going to be used by f and v correct just F and B. Okay. Well, then my comment still stands. It applies to any future vehicle that is shared by F and B and the DPW or whatever. They just don't want to get burned like that again. That's just, uh, you know. So if it's just for F and B, then what I'm saying does not apply, but it will in the future. Okay, any other comments? 
Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the utilities truck conversion for an amount not to exceed $2,581. Support. Motion by Mr. Palmer, support by Mr. Cummings. Roll call. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Nordine, yes. Mr. Gajewski. Yes. Ms. McGuire. Is that, that motion is for Trans Auto Glass, correct, Bill? Yes. Okay, yeah. Mr. Byer. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Mr. Weed. Yes, motion's passed. Vactor truck repair. All right, well, I am very happy to report that the Vactor truck is back in service for the township. So your packet contains a summary. The Vactor truck repairs from Jack to Haney Company, totaling $68,444.67. And mm. half to be paid to the sewer fund 590-000-974.000 and half to the water fund 591. 000974.000. The grand total of the repair is more understandable when detailed with four different components from the tank and body subtotal, and that was that's the majority of $61,170.26. There was a hoist cylinder subtotal previously discussed with the board, and that was $4,676.98. Um, there was a vacuum relief valve. Um, it was not functioning properly um, and, and failing. And so um, obviously, you know, this and the delivery charge are new since, since the last time we discussed. Um, and the proposed increases to this project are, are well under the, the 15,000 purchasing limit, but I'm bringing it to the township's board for approval. It, it has been delivered and um, back in the DPW. So, we are very happy to have our Vactor truck back and operational. Any comments? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve payment for the Vector truck repairs to the Dak Doheny Company in the amount of $68,444.67. Support that. Motion by Mr. Palmer, support by Mr. Byer. Did I have that right, Mr. Byer? Yes, you do. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Gajewski. Yes. Ms. McGuire. Yes. Mr. Byer. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Nordine, yes. Mr. Weed. Yes, motion's passed. Request from Asable Township to approve the sewer extension project. All right, so in accordance with the contract for sanitary sewer services, Asable Township is formally requested approval to expand its sanitary sewer system. Your packet contains a sanitary sewer contract extension. Uh, board members will note the language in sections 10 and 12 deal directly with sanitary sewer expansion. The requests from Osable Township and supporting documentation are detailed in your packet, as well as responses from F and V. Uh, regional manager detailed the, the 15th of April with the supporting documentation for the impacted lift station number four. Again, that all that information is directly from the SAW um, program. The board members should note that the initial average daily flow from the requested sanitary sewer expansion would be a flow of 11,000 gallons per day. The average daily flow could increase up to 30,000 gallons per day when all customers are connected to the sanitary sewer system. The GDP flow data translates into approximately 250 current Osable Township users of the sanitary system. The proposed expansion would increase that by approximately 160 users up to a total of 410 total Osable Township sanitary sewer system users. Osable Township is hopeful that construction can be completed for 
the proposed sanitary sewer expansion by fall of 2021. That is depending on USDA grant slash loan funding options. And Osable Township's request requires Township Board approval. Comments? How sure are they of the 160 added uh, customers? I think it's a no-brainer, or are they just kind of winging it? Do you know? Well, they, if you look um, in in the packet, and you'll see the map. Um, it was provided by uh, Gary Bartow with with F and V, and in that map, um, it gives a high level. So if you look at page forty six of the the packet, in um, the it'd be the bottom right hand corner, it shows the U S twenty three extension, and um, mm -hmm. basically um, that runs down twenty three, and. Yes. That um, that part of town right there in Osabel obviously um, is being impacted by the high water table, and um, you would have a lot of people that would be very happy to have uh, uh, the option for sewer. I'm guessing, Dave, that the distance that we're talking about goes down to Huron House B and B is that correct? Yeah, right around there, a little bit. Uh, but between there and the northern end, presently, there's quite a few resorts there, isn't it? and uh, you know multiple cabins. Uh, does it also include Huron Sands condos? Yes. No. They will be on this. I. I... I honestly can't tell you that cat uh, is cat calf is on there. We might be able to unmute her. Yeah, okay. I think this is Martin. I think the sewer program right now for a goes down to that uh, condominium complex where the Wabin used to be. I think that's yeah. all the further goes south. And I think they're counting. So I don't know if they're counting all these. Uh, Resorts as a single hookup, or if a resort has 15 units. Now, when well, I had resort, I had 14 units. I had 14. I had one hookup, but I had 14 people supplying that one hookup. Right. So I don't know how uh -huh. they're getting their numbers. Right. So with these connections, they've determined the connections, and um, and then what's going to come through those connections. You know, whether that's multiple users or single users, and what the flow is going to be into our system. And on the evaluation of our system, our system can handle the capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, um, so it's just a matter of whether, you know, we're going to approve of this additional flow into our system. Um, mm -hmm. Any other thing about, you know, beyond that, but on our side of things, it's just a matter of what flow we have coming in and what we have to do to modify, to accommodate the flow, which really we don't have to modify anything because our, our system is already set up for the additional capacity. Okay. I, How much I, additional I understand capacity? what you're saying. Aaron, Go how ahead. much additional what? capacity? If we have expansion in Oscoda Township, do we have to expand that in the near future? No, we've got uh, we got quite a bit of capacity in our system. Okay. Aaron, Kath, Kath Wynn is... Uh, on she's muted if you scroll down you can unmute her she she would be able she's in attendance tonight she is self-muted oh there she is hello hi kath hi having a bad hair day so no video sorry guys <laughs> um uh yeah i i know that when i spoke with uh gary bartow in regard to that proposed project um, they are calculating that based on the number of residential equivalency units, um, you know, not just direct hookups to address Mr. Mr. Byers' um, concern. Um, that yeah, they, I think that all of the available connections, all the you know residences, businesses, um, uh, resorts, all through there are in that calculation for the for the number of users and the amount of flow. Okay. Uh, okay, my, my concern, uh, Cass, is just 
you know, there are several, like the Huron Sands thing, but maybe they're already hooked up, as I think that's what Martin was saying. But further on down, people that have lived in Oscoda for a while, there used to be a restaurant complex called the Wabin. And that is now gone, but there's a big condo, rather large condo project down there. And I'm wondering if Osabel has figured that as one or two users, or they're going through every condo. I don't know the name of it. Somebody that's part of the meeting may know, but it's pretty big, and it's further south, but it uh, certainly would be part of the whole picture. Anybody know the name of that? I think it's built by B&B. Wabin Restaurant. Really old people like Jamie. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were awake. That's I'm all. here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah I know you are. Lisa I know you Sutton are. just said it's here on Sands, and it's already connected to the system. So there, You're on Sands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Huron Sands is not what I'm talking about, I don't think. Oh. Huron Sands is the condo that's the closest to the bridge and next to the putt-putt golf that is no longer there. That's no, Huron that Sands. Is, that is not, the Huron Sands is, is down farther actually. Um, there, oh. there, I know which one you're talking about. Like I said, they have incorporated every building unit that is already built in that stretch that would be eligible for connection. So I'm sure okay. that the condo, the condo unit, um, and I'm not sure how many, how many residential units there are back there, but a lot of times with condominiums, um, they only calculate their residency on like one, between one and two persons um, because of the fact that, you know, a lot of them are retirement homes. So they're not people with buku children you know, living yeah. in those those units. But I, that's my understanding is every every currently built structure um, between here and there had, was, in, was included in that calculation. Okay, all right. Jamie, that was a joke, okay? I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, poke, I, I poke, picked, poke. I, I picked on you, be, I picked on you because- You knew I a, could take it? Um, the Wabin, you, you you would know that, right? You remember I the Wabin restaurant? Marty yes. would too. Yeah. Yeah, I remember it, Jim. I ate there many times. Mm -hmm. I have a I have a couple of questions. Uh, the the first one I I pretty sure we already have the answer to. I think Catherine has answered this before, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it anyway. Uh, we have all the data from the uh, the pump capacity and everything. Uh, I was curious about the lagoon system. I, I, I think perhaps that's been answered before, or that we have adequate capacity there. I would just like to uh, verify that. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, another question I had in the packet on page 45, um, there's uh, some information and it says 1.0 introduction. And it says the, town, the Charter Township of Wasaba owns and operates wastewater collection. Uh, it says the wastewater from the township is pumped to West Bay County for treatment. Does anybody have any idea what that means? It's, it's probably a typo um, coming out of the office. Um, I'll have to look at that and, and, and kick that back to the engineer, but they probably utilized um, a, uh, another document as a template and failed to replace that because um, that would have been out of our Midland office that does work with West Bay County. Okay, yeah, I kind of thought that was probably what had happened, but um, it had all the information from, uh, you know, our, the pumps. The other question I had is in, uh, uh, let me get to it, it's page uh, 52, I believe. And that is, um, it has a schematic of the, uh, the pump station. And I noted that, that that was from 1985, which means that was 35 years ago because it's from a different engineering firm. And uh, it's called pump station 13. I wasn't, I wasn't clear on what 
what that was. I don't I don't have the packet open in front of me. I'm going to have to look at that. What was that page 53 you said? Uh, page 52. 52 and 43 was the other? Uh, 45. Page 45 where it says introduction just as that one page of what I'm assuming was a report. Uh, the, the schematic on page 52 is, is something from 1985. And it was from, uh, it says, Ascoda Asabo Utilities Authority. Um, and let me see if I can, it's from uh, Edmonds Engineering. Uh, what I was, what was unclear to me was that it's, it's labeled as uh, pump station number 13. And that, I didn't know that we had any 13 pump stations. Has that just been renumbered somehow or? It's possible um, because there are, uh, in total for the entire uh, Asabo and Ascoda combined system, there are 28 pump stations. Um, and at that may have been pump station number 13 before they added the stations on the base. Um, you know, based on the age of that drawing. Um, mm -hmm. And so therefore it may have been pump station 13 and it was renumbered because now the stations that were um, operated by Ascoda and then were taken back several years ago for um, operation by Asable are basically like stations 26, 27, and 28. So, you know, at, at the time that this drawing was done, it, I, my assumption would be that it was done before the base was de decommissioned and when they were still utilizing the mechanical plant in downtown Oscoda before that um, occurred. Yeah, and I, it, the reason I brought it up is that it, it, it's, it's from 1985, so it's 35 years old, uh, but it obviously is still in, in use. But I think that what was probably wanted to be focused on was in the uh, lower left-hand corner of that page. It has the mechanical pump schedule and it has the pump capacity at that time of 520 gallons per minute. Uh, uh, it has some other uh, pump specifications, but that I thought that probably was what was intended to be shown from that schematic. Um, although I, I'm not certain of that. Yes, that, that station is um, actually the station that is immediately upstream of the connection between Asabal and Ascoda. Um, that currently discharges into a manhole. Um, that pump station, I believe it's number two from Dwight Street, also discharges into. There was some confusion in regard to um, pump stations and IDs at one point, and that was why, is because they discharge into the same, you know, re receiving manhole and then go from there down further into pump station number four, which pumps all of the sewage from the downtown area out to the main list station on the base. So um, when I had spoken with Gary Bartow, he said, you know, at the time that those systems were interconnected, that the sewer transmission main was approved to take the capacity, the full capacity of that station of 520 gallons per minute, which what they're, you know, what is cur currently pumping and what they would propose for it to be pumping is far less from that. And he was using that as a validation that they didn't need to do a hydraulic study on the downstream sewer piping because they're still significantly below the capacity of that pump station, which is currently connected to the system and was approved to be connected. Okay, very good. Thank you, Catherine. Any other comments? And are they just going to be uh, underneath this uh, contract we got now? They're just to add this to this contract, or is it going to be a new contract written? So right now, the contract that uh, was provided, that goes through um, May of 2021. So between now and, and May 2021, 
um, we're going to have to negotiate a uh, another five year contract, or um, you know, we we have a year before that contract is up. Okay, it's going to be about a year before this is completed, anyhow. And my other question is: Are they pursuing still pursuing their own source treatment plan over there? So right now, the the USDA application that is being submitted does not include a lagoon system. Their application to the USDA is simply a uh, sewer expansion project. Okay. Any other comments? I'll make a motion that we approve the, the request from Asable Township to approve the sewer expansion project and make it a top priority. I support. Motion by Ms. McGuire, support from Mr. Palmer. Roll call. Ms. McGuire. Yes. Mr. Byer. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Nordine, yes. Mr. Gaski. Yes. Mr. Weed. Yes. Motion's passed. All right. Establish 2020 Refuse Drop Off Program. Okay. So your packet contains the uh, contract as well as a flyer for the Refuse Drop Off Program. Um, Typically, how this is uh, run, it's, it's run twice a year by the township. Typically, it's on the second Saturday of June and the second Saturday of September. This year, if we follow that uh, similar trend, that would be lined up for Saturday, June 13th and Saturday, September 12th. And um, what we're trying to do is it, we're trying to get ahead of this. Um, obviously, um, typically we would have already had this out there and, uh, people would be, um, be, be able to buy permits at the treasurer's office by simply walking in. And so what I want to be able to do is, is try to get the dates lined up. Um, and then as soon as Township Hall is able to be open, uh, we would start selling the permits out of the treasurer's office um, for June 13th would be the first date. Comments? I'm sure everybody after being inside for this long is going to have a lot of stuff to get rid of. <laughs> it's a very popular program. <laughs> Every year. Yeah, that right. Yeah, that right. You're, you're right. We sold quite a few um, the last time around, and um, we already have our tickets ready to be able to start selling now. It's not like we have to order anything. Pam usually gets the flyer ready and gets that over to and gets that taken care of, and so it shouldn't take long to pull that together. Is the vendor under the current contract available for service? He, yes, uh, the vendor is and has already provided updated insurance certificates. So um, what, what you'll notice in there, um, we, we did do a slight modification. Um, the, only, the only big difference that you're going to see within there, um, on page 72 uh, of your packet, consideration number six, contractor will provide the township receipts from the landfill within two weeks of each drop off refuse event dated June 13th and September 12th, 2020. Um, that is new language in there. And um, that's really the, the only modification that, uh, that we put in there. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> thought when I was looking through this, uh, Dave, that it seemed to be, I think you put uh, two, two different contracts in the package. And the one, one, of, one says that it would be twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. Um, the, 
question I had, and I don't know why I didn't notice this before, it's, it has an amount of 3,250 per year. Um, is, that, is that supposed to be total for the, the two dates or is that per event? So what you'll see in here, um, the, uh, this was initially going to be a once a year event. Obviously, it has uh, increased in popularity, and uh, the township mm -hmm. board then went from the original once a year event to a twice a year event. Um, and so the, the original document from uh, 2014 was uh, the intention was to do once a year, and then that has evolved into a, a twice a year event. So that, that language which was 3250 per year should be uh, changed to per event. Per event. And Just, what you're, you're under the consideration portion there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Therefore, the total contract amount per year, unless otherwise mutually agreed by parties to this contract. Okay. I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I guess the uh, the twice a year would be the six thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, and I, I went back to last year when we had the two events, and uh, the first one, uh, the first event we had, we actually was so uh, used that we they brought in more containers, and we actually paid four thousand seven hundred thirty-five dollars, and then the uh, second one of that year we paid three thousand four hundred sixty one dollars so um that that guess that thirty two fifty is sort of a flexible number depending on the number of containers that they have to use which is based on the participation by the residents I, i'm guessing yeah and so that's we kind of have it in there as far as you know additional um uh containers but yes i think um that that I, I hear what you're saying as far as being able to up that. Yeah, they've they've itemized it out what our requirements are for a certain number of of containers, and that's where they come up with a 3250. Um, but we have surpassed that on on several occasions, and they've provided the additional equipment, and and therefore we pay the additional money for that service. Okay, that was all. I think it's a good program. I, I'm all in favor of it. Any other comments? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, trash drop off program for 2020 support motion by mr palmer support by mr buyer roll call mr nordine yes mr buyer yes mr cummings yes miss mcguire yes mr gayeski yes mr palmer yes mr weed yes motions passed amendment to the iron bell grant all right so you'll You'll see in your packet there, um, this is a, an amendment, uh, the extension of the grant through September 30th of 2020. And uh, this was uh, provided by the DNR to the township as far as the IET phase three engineering. What, what you'll see under there is in, it's a very brief explanation. It says extension of grant timeline due to the governor's executive order on discretionary spending freeze. So this just has to do with extending the time frame of the grant program. Correct. All right. Any other comments? Is there a motion? I'll make the motion that we approve the amendment to the Iron Bell Grant. Support. Motion by Ms. McGuire, support by Mr. Palmer. 
Roll call. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. McGuire. Yes. Mr. Gajewski. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Nordeen, yes. Mr. Byer. Yes. Mr. Weed. Yes, motion passed. <laughs> Closing the sweep account. Uh, so as I outlined before, when Mr. Palmer asked me what that was, I just am looking for board approval to uh, be able to close the sweep account and move all the funds into one account so it can be reconciled together. Any comments? Uh, which account would that be reconciled into, Jamie? Common checking. Common checking? Correct. That's the one with the target balance of $425,000 in it right now. And then the rest gets sweeped out on a daily and nightly basis to, um, well, it used to earn more interest, but now it's basically earning the same interest. So, and we're not getting any benefit by fees being waived or anything like that. So it's really kind of useless. Any other comments? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, eliminate the uh, township sweep account and transfer that money into the common checking. There's a motion by Mr. Palmer. Is there support? Yeah, I will support this. Motion by Mr. Palmer, support by Mr. Byer. Roll call. Mr. Byer. That was me? Yes. yes. Uh, vote yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. McGuire. Yes. Mr. Gajewski. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Nordine, yes. Mr. Weed. Yes, motion's passed. All right, we're into the public comment period. There's a four minute time limit. Please introduce yourself when you talk. Um, to start this off, um, everyone who's on a smart device, um, using Zoom through a smart device, if you can use the raise hand function um, next to your name, um, and uh, I'll see who's ready to make a public comment. And for those who are on phones, um, I will unmute and, um, uh, and then you can let me know if you're going to make a public comment. So um, the two people who are on phones, do you have public comment? I do not. Okay. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, and who is this? Greg Schultz. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Greg Schultz, Cedar Lake Road. Um, I guess with the normal township meetings, the first public comment period has always required a comment card be submitted prior to the meeting to the superintendent. The comments usually fall into just a few categories someone with a public service announcement for a group or organization, someone with an issue with the township or a business has an agenda, or someone giving the board some Monday morning quarterbacking advice. So not getting too waxed at the board doesn't seem to be a big deal to me within the concept of normal business. Uh, I guess I have a little bit of a surprise of preparing the township for reopening that why the department heads can't come in and safely into the township hall and put down social distancing markings and such prior to opening the business perhaps uh, on the 15th of may um, seems like that's something that could be done uh, also would like to let you know that 
Congressman Kildee did have a uh, virtual press release today. I, I don't know if any of you are on it, um, but he did reiterate that the $54 million that Congress had allocated and 13.5 of that was earmarked for Wordsmith was for remediation, not more studies. Uh, and I do think that uh, he and the now group and, and a lot of people are working on that uh, to, to hopefully get the Air Force's attention and do something positive uh, in this in situation. Uh, and the last thing, I guess, I, I don't know that, and I haven't been going to the Alcona or the uh, Iosco County board meetings, and I, and I maybe should have been, there, and I don't know how they even do them now, uh, but this EMS response time uh, report uh, seemed really uh, surprising to me. You know, if you went through and looked at all the times they excluded, they were all, every single one of them was well over their average response time. And when you look at average response time, it should include the anomalies, not exclude them, which seemed totally bizarre to me. Uh, and there wasn't a good explanation on, on them. And I, I understand it was just a report, you know, on multiple calls. But I, I tried, I studied the report when they said they had multiple calls. I couldn't figure out what they were excluding, if it was the first call that came in or the last call because the times didn't make sense. Uh, when they had weather-related issues and some other unit had to come in, that has nothing to do with the reality that somebody was waiting for an hour before an ambulance showed up. So uh, that whole situation doesn't really look that great to me. So anyway, I don't know what we can do about it. Obviously, they're asking looks like they may be asking for a whole lot more money and maybe that can uh, change the supervision there so they can keep people. I don't know. That's all. All right. Thank you. Anybody else have public comment? All right, then we're on to board comment. Does anybody have anything? Oh, uh, sorry, let me back that up one. We did have um, a comment on the uh, chat here from Gabriel uh, Sandifer, I believe, about the seasonal campers um, getting some um, refund, time of refund since, um, and uh, that is an item we will be discussing um, with the park manager to work out that detail. Okay, so for uh, board comment, go ahead. Okay, so I got two different ones. So something just occurred to me with Al, and I don't know if you can unmute him um, or if he's still unmuted. Uh, for like the June reservations, I know that usually that first day that they're open to take reservations, it's like crazy busy. Um, how are they gonna handle that situation for like Memorial Day reservations and June reservations? Have they thought about that? Yeah, we are kind of going to take it as it comes. We're going to try to take reservations beginning uh, on the 16th. Um, I was just writing up my, my um, note to give to the campers. Um, we don't have our seasonal uh, office staff in yet. As of now, it's just the maintenance staff. But uh, that's something Tara and I and Dave will certainly discuss uh, before it happens. OK, thanks, Al. Um, and I did not see an update from Todd Dickerson tonight. And I just was wondering how many of the local businesses or area businesses have they been able to help with the COVID relief programs that they were offering? Let's see here. Let's see. Todd, I know um, out of the five county area, mm -hmm. it was uh, $200,000. <clears> Iosco <throat> County got just shy of $49,000 from the five county area. Um, and then out of that, um, that 48 or just shy of $49,000 had to get spread through 
obviously, you know, the Tawas area, the Oscoda area, Plainfield, all, all the different municipalities. So uh, in total, I don't know how many businesses, but that, hold on one second, because I might be able to pull up his... Uh, Okay, so let's see here. MEDC Relief Grant Program, Northeastern Michigan, the Council of Government. So NEMCOG is 12 counties. Our subregion within that um, was Target Alpena was the main uh, administer and that, that includes Alpena County, Alcona, Iosco, Presqu'il, and Sheboygan counties. Mm -hmm. uh, MEDC allocated 200,000 in available grants and a potential 200,000 in loans. The MEDC has final awarding authority um, the grants were decided by a 10 person committee. Iosco County was approved for 49,000. Target Alpena region received just short of 300 applications. 67 of those were from Iosco County. 116 grant applications were funded, 24 from Iosco, and nine specifically from Oscoda Township and Osable Township. Target Alpena uh, region received seven loan applications. Four businesses were nominated for MEDC loan program consideration, one being from Oscoda Osable Township. Thank you. No problem. Okay, any other board members have a comment? Yes, for uh, phase two of the water main, or I guess I could rephrase that, Oscoda Street, where does that fall in the water main extension uh, phase planning? Is that, yeah, it's a connector street between Cedar Lake Road and US 23. That okay. one falls into, um, I, don't, I don't remember which phase offhand, but it is um, one of the ones that I requested funds from the state for. Okay, so it didn't get combined into phase two, but it's it may it may be it's scheduled for one of the next phases potentially. Right. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, that area is is um, you know it's impacted by it um, considerably, so it's it's higher up on the list. Yeah, that's the one area where someone's well failed or it's fa in the process of failing, they're struggling by with filters. And, and so that was the reason for my question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I did ask for the money for it. Um, just have no idea how this is going to work out with the way the, uh, the COVID has, is impacting uh, the state finances. Any other comments? Um, I did see in there where um, the county ambulance service did request an increase in the millage to uh, up to 0.8 mils. Um, I was glad to see that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the county does go th through with that. And, um, and if they do, that the service gets improved. The, the next full board meeting for the Iosco County Commissioners is set for May 6th at 9.30 a.m. And so that would be next Wednesday is May 6th at 9.30 a.m. Um, it's, I, I mean, it's gonna be held on Zoom. Uh, you could see if you saw the, the picture from the 
uh, paper. They were having a Zoom meeting and um, the, the link for that would be placed on the website. It's iosco.net. All right, um, then I guess that's it. Need a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, we are adjourned. Thanks everybody for joining. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Who did we get that motion from? Mr. Byer. Perfect, thank you.